All right, so you're still tuning into the AM show here on the Join News Channel, and we're going on to the main conversation we're having for this morning. It has to do with COVID-19. I, as I indicated, it's that Friday when most people typically be preparing for their fun weekend that will involve parties, funerals, and other fun stuff. But all that has to be done with a lot of caution because we're in a pandemic. A pandemic that's a party pooper, a pandemic that's cramping our lifestyle. So a look at the COVID-19 dashboard in the last few days points to a decline in active cases. If you look at it, uh, it's currently looking at 5,779. It actually was almost 7,000. It actually went past 7,000. So it gives you the indication that, well, things are getting back to normal. Things are easing up. This morning, we'll delve into the figures and go beyond the key stats with one COVID-19 watcher who's researched, spoken, and followed Ghana's pandemic journey more than most people. Dr. Kwame Sapong is serious a pharmacist and CDD Ghana fellow. And usually, he'll be speaking to us uh, via Zoom from uh, his base in London. Today, he's here in the studio with us. Good morning to you, uh, Dr. Kwame Sapong. And welcome to uh, joining studios. I mean, this is the first time I am hosting you here in, in studio, even though We've done quite a bit of, of work um, online and uh, on, on Zoom. So you're welcome. And uh, how's, uh, how's it been like so far for you in, in the well, country? Well, it's, it's been um, fun, challenging. Yeah. Obviously, you know the circumstances under yes. which I came into the country. And uh, on behalf of uh, the team here, condolences to you on, the, on, your, on, the, um, on your bereavement, and, uh, as well as your brother as well. So, Dr. Kwame Sapon, you see who happens to have a, a very famous brother as well. He is the <laughs> Director of Public Health of the Ghana Health Service, who's uh, Dr. Franklin is here to back when it looks like your family is all doctors, doctors. Well, um, well, we seem to have a fair part of them around us. But, like I said, um, I came into the country under those circumstances. And with the pandemic going on, we had to give my uncle a fitting send-off. And at the back of my mind was all these statistics. Yeah, yeah. So having gone through that process, I can understand your initial um, introduction about today being a Friday, because last Friday, I was at the exact position that ex a lot of people would be moving into a weekend. So yes, I can see the dynamics. Yeah. And you know, there, there are lots of people who actually think that I was saying that we're looking at the figures, the active cases, that people who are not actually looking at the figures, but they tell themselves that they don't think that uh, there's any COVID because they say that they haven't actually met anyone or known people who have died from COVID. I, as much as I feel that that's unfortunate, but that's the perception out there. Yes, I mean, it's quite an interesting perception. Um, because if you look at the mortalities, I'll start by saying that all through this pandemic, I have been very, very skeptical about using mortality, and I'll explain why, as a means of judging the trajectory of the pandemic. And the reason is that if you alienate yourself from the emotions of bereavement, that actually, in a way, eases the pressure of the, on the health system because the person is off the health system, is off the active cases, it decreases the pressure on health professionals and all that. But it also is a parameter that tells you how the pandemic is impacting on the general population. And in countries like Ghana, you, if you look all through till about May, the people who were losing their lives where what I call are cherry-picked human resources. I mean, you know quite a lot of them. Prominent individuals. Prominent individuals, from people who are heading our security, from people who actually taught me. I lost my classmate and my colleague, Professor Kufu, to this pandemic. I've lost cousins, doctor, and um, what do you call a presiding member at a point in the pandemic. So I can catalog close to 150 people that I know personally, not in the UK where I live, but in Ghana who've passed. So when I hear people say, I don't know anyone who's passed, it's so mind boggling because it's like, are they living in a false paradise? But the truth of the matter is the answer 
Maybe no. It is no because initially this pandemic was actually disproportionately hospitalizing. And obviously, it's the hospitalization that leads to critical and severe care and unfortunately to mortality. People in the middle and upper middle classes, and that is why there was all these conversations around Christmas about they were the ones holding the parties and all those things that were leading to super spread events and subsequently were leading to um, hospitalizations and mortalities. Yeah. But if you just oppose that to what's going on, I mean, if you look at the data, there have been disproportionately more deaths after those episodes than there were before. So if you look at us at the 31st of December, for example, there were about 336 mortalities. Now what do we see? 1,084. What does it mean? Mortalities have started in the larger segment of the population yeah. who actually are not known names that we can mention, but because they are not names as well, and they don't have that uh, social connection, no one is taking the mortality figure seriously. But it is still affecting families. And in fact, it affected twice as many families from 31st of December till now. In fact, three times as many, because yeah. 336 now, 1,089. We'll come into and look at the statistics, but I believe there's a reason people would have that perception that the COVID really, it's um, in crime for your area and uh, people who are affluent and all of that. And isn't it because typically the virus is imported? So people who have the means to travel outside or who frequent um, travel, travel, you know, they arrive by air, they come in, and when they come in, they're mixing or mingling with their kind of peers who, who are typically middle upper class. And that's why people tend to say that, yeah, the virus, even the virus is there, it's amongst the, the rich folks. Even though they will forget that, yes, it trickles down. You see, if you want to look at it from that point, then you have to look at how pandemic spread. So you're right in saying the importation, because the virus is foreign to these lands. It's foreign, to, actually, to most lands, yes. including even China, where it originated from. But, so when it gets into a country, that's what we call assortative spread, which is what you've demonstrated. Spreading amongst your peers. They come to your house, they fraternize, you go to parties with them, they're in the offices. Then there's the second segment of spread, which is called disassortative spread. So you take it home. You give it to your house help or your security guard or your driver, and they take it into the second echelon of the community where they live. Unfortunately, with disassortative spread, one of the things that happens is these other communities are more congested than the first echelon that it came from. Because yes. you live in your house probably with your wife and a couple of kids. Occasionally someone has come there. You give it to this driver. The driver lives maybe in a slum environment, but maybe because they are working in a corporate establishment, not too congested. But they go there, they fraternize with the next segment, and it goes into the lower echelons. What the data suggests is happening in Ghana. It's when it goes that lower, because of a number of factors that we're still not sure, but one of them being our lower median age. What it means is we have a much younger population. Our median age is 19.3. When it gets into those people, they actually don't fall very sick. They are what we call the asymptomatic, and that's why they tell you that 75% uh, plus will be asymptomatic. But what happens? They then reverse the spread because when it gets into them they also go through assortative spread they spread it amongst their lot but what happens they reverse the spread and do disassortative spread back into the population from which they got it and then what we get is what we call the mixed spread model that is when it becomes more lethal because when they are coming they are a large population size and if you want to understand this you have to just look at work babe and the work they've done yeah. and other serial prevalence studies that are going on and you realize that though our data, if you look at it, all confirmed cases, 100, let's say 123,000, we are 31.3 million people. What does that mean? Less than 1% of Ghanaians have actually tested positive for COVID. When they've actually done seroprevalence, which is a test of how many people have antibodies, 
they are getting 30 plus percent. Exactly. Which means three in 10 have actually had an infection. And that is where the mixed spread modeling starts comes in, coming in. Then you have the second bit, which is those in those echelons of the population, if they do not have strong immune systems and other things, even though the median age is low, even though their chemistry is much stronger, they start unfortunately falling sick, they get hospitalized. And if they are in parts of the country where the health system doesn't have the capabilities of where, where the so-called area people live, then unfortunately the pressure on the system would also lead to a drop in the quality of care and that would lead to mortalities as well. And that is what we're seeing and that's why yeah. the mortalities are accelerating, especially with the Delta variant, which has a high reproductive number. So those, there's a lot of dynamics going on there. And then there, there are those two who say, okay, so if it's, if the spread is that bad, why are we not seeing so many people, you know, falling in like, and coming into the hospitals? It's, it's got to do with this whole um, disconnect between the actual infection rate as predicted by serial prevalence and the, um, what do you call it, the numbers that are testing positive. Because what constitutes the numbers that are testing positive currently in Ghana? If you're traveling out of the country, you've got to do a test. Right. So you might be healthy, it might be picked that you're infected and therefore you cannot travel. But more importantly, you might go into the hospital because you're unwell and be tested and test positive. Or you might work for an organization for which they have to do routine testing and they find that you're positive. So if you're working in the general population, we are not aggressively testing. I can do a comparison with the UK where you are encouraged to test. Anyone can go to the pharmacy and get a test and has to test twice a week. So you'd see the- And it's free of charge? It's free of charges. And you see the data coming out of the UK. So you see that though vaccination is quite high, now it's almost 71% doubly vaccinated, there is a large number of active cases that are currently coming up. The hospitalization is relatively low. But the disease is segmented between the ages of 12 and 16 years. They form about 70% of the people who are getting infected. Unfortunately, what's happening is that they are then causing cross-infection into the much older population. So you see that even though the mortalities are quite low, they have been going up considerably. So what's happened? The UK has now taken a decision this week to vaccinate 12 to 15 year olds. From a strict- It's because they, they also have the vaccines. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. From a strict global perspective, I cringe at that decision, though I have been following the decision making because it's going to have an impact on the vaccine supply chain. But the truth of the matter is because they are tracking the, uh, the infection rates in the community. They are moving actively, with it. They are moving vaccination at a targeted rate to the segments of the population where the infection is situated. And in parallel, they are trying to give booster jabs to the segment of the population that these younger people are infecting who unfortunately are now accounting for the new mortalities because they are vaccinated, but their immune systems are not strong enough to give the antibody response that they need. So you realize that there is a parallel fight to actually control the pandemic. We don't have those luxuries in Ghana because we don't have that many vaccines, because we are not doing active community testing. And I don't think now there's a lot of free testing going on because testing is expensive and the government cannot just, have, especially in a country where we use disproportionately high number of PCR tests that cost an arm and a leg compared yeah. with the antigen tests. So these are all things that, in my view, impact on our pandemic management strategy. But like I always say, if as a people, we all decided over a six weeks period to wear face masks, that could stop all this, just over a six weeks period. But, but when I've come into the country and I've seen, it's virtually non-existent. I drove from Accra to Kumasi um, a few days ago, and no one can be bothered about wearing face masks. <laughs> so you, you ask yourself, do we understand the dynamics of yeah. what's going on? And the further you go away from the urban areas, the more, uh, the lower 
the compliance to the COVID-19 protocols is. That's true. And that's a worry because of exactly what I'm saying. So I don't know if you want to go to the data. You let's, let's go to the data. So let's look at what we have now. New cases, 180. It indicates a decline. Because we used to have it in the 500s and the rest, it's come down. So we have active cases also of 5,779, which is also indicating a decline, because it used to be a lot higher, over 7,000. And then the confirmed cases, 122,543, and the deaths, 1,084. Now, so that is what it looks like right now. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, um, routine surveillance and hand contact tracing, international travelers, and all of that. And then you look at the severe uh, cases, severe critical, severe 129, critical 51, and dead 1,084, as we have it now, and then active cases uh, 5,779. So this is what it looks like. And then we can also look at the regions and the regional breakdown and get to see what that also looks like. Okay, so here's what we have for 5th September. So Ahafo, Shanti, uh, clearly we're looking at Greater Accra having the most. Yes. So they, they're having um, 4,099 mm -hmm. active cases. And then it's followed by the Ashanti region, obviously. 4,000, okay, so we lost that, but yes, we can always go back to that quickly. Okay, so here's what, yeah. So then we have um, Ashanti 428, and then from Ashanti, we're going to, I believe, Westing, which is 248. So yes, these are the figures, and um, feel free to interrogate them. So, you see, it would have been good on this if we had the mortality data. All right. So that we know what the mortality looks like region by region. But without it, you can still infer. OK. And Maybe let me give you the June 1 figures as well. So it tells us where we're right. coming from. So this is uh, June 1. We had 1,093 active cases. And then the deaths were oh, 786. 786. Okay. So if you go back to that. Maybe let me just go back to this. Yeah. So 1,084 right now, so but it used to be yeah, 786. If you go back to the middle one so that we can look at it. So you need to situate this properly. From March, when we had our first case, to the 31st of December, we had 336 deaths. From June 1, 786 to today, 1,084. 1,084, we've had close to the same number of deaths in as many weeks as we had in the entire year. Yeah. That should be concerning to everybody. And that's why community non-compliance and questions around, have you seen anyone who's dead, concern me. Because when you've had, from June to now, it's nine weeks. You've had as many deaths in nine weeks as you had in an entire 48 week period from March to um, June. December. Well, yeah. Yes. It tells you the level of acceleration because you've got five times more acceleration in mortalities than you've got. And that is the data and what it says. Now, when you start looking at this, though the mortalities are not there, you can infer. And what do I mean by so that? So, ideally, we could have had the number of deaths, deaths per region. Then, yes. And break down the 1,084. But without that, the thing about COVID is when you get it, you either recover, you die, or you're an active case. So you can look at the discharge, and it can tell you a story. Look at Savannah. Only 75.6% of their cases have recovered. Look at the active cases. It tells you about 13, 14. Their case mortality rate is significantly high. Yeah. Because there's no midline. You either get it, recover, an active case, or you, or you die. So that tells you that even though they are not getting many cases of COVID, you are more likely to pass away if you lived in Savannah region than you are in Greater Accra region. Why? 
Because if you look at Greater Accra Region, 93.4, that means less than 1, 2% of the people are losing their life to COVID, compared with something in the Savannah region that is much, much higher. Then you can look again, you can see the same picture for Northeast, 87.9%, and you can make the same inference. And then you can look at Upper West, 90.6. So you realize that, why am I saying that? If you look at the recovery rate, average recovery rate, 94.4, and you do what we call a normal distribution, these are huge deviations, 75.6 from that. You are talking about close to 19% of the pack of recovery. That is a statistical concern. And so any uh, thing that is above 90, mm, that's fine. Ideally, you'd want all of them to be near, around 94.4%. We are not getting that. And that is what I was in my introductory comment saying that you, when you have the number of active cases going up, and the spread is away from the urban areas, you are going to see a dip in the quality of care and a spike in mortality. And the data from the Ghana Health Service clearly points that out. I want us to, this, this bit that you've raised um, is quite worrying, and I think we should ponder it for a, a, a bit. So essentially you're saying that if you look at the recovery and discharge rate, for each of the regions, it tells a story. Yes. So that if you have anything significantly deviating from the average, the national average, that's worrying. Yes. And the ones that stand out will be Savannah. Yes. And you're saying essentially that if you're in the Savannah region or you get COVID in the Savannah region, you're more likely to die. Yes. Compared with Greater compared Accra. with someone who is in uh, the Greater Accra region, yes. for instance, and that is to dispel the Isika. I've, I've made these um, observations, and I'm trying to make them public because it dispels the initial preamble that you gave. Sabi, it's a Greater Accra region of the East. Maybe it, it used to be. be. <laughs> yes, it might be disproportionately because you cannot compare. Um, what do you call it, 65, um, 61,000 plus, or 65,000 plus 66,000 cases over the period to 205. But if you unfortunately find yourself in the court of 205, your probability of not making it is much higher. And that should be a concern because the number of people getting it there should not, under normal circumstances, be putting as much pressure on the health system as it would do in a place where 65,000. But then, if you go back and look at our spread of health professionals, you would understand why that's going on, because we have a disproportionately lower number of health professionals in places like the Savannah region. And these are the things that I believe the community should understand and get serious about what I have been saying, wearing the face mask. Because if you live there and say it's Kafoya area and you don't follow the protocols, you are putting yourself at risk. And it's as simple as that. And another thing we probably should be looking at when we're talking about the Savannah region is that you're also not likely to have more testing facilities. Yes. So it, me it means then that we're, not test we're probably not testing as many people, and that if we're testing more people in the Savannah region, the numbers could go up, and then the deaths or the critical cases would also go up. You see, that's poignant. But you have to look at it from, how's the testing going on currently? What's the average cost of a test now? It's about 250 Ghana cities. Is, is yes. it not like the ball? 250 cities. You can actually pay, get a uh, test done for 250 cities. Yes, so ball. It's about the cheapest. OK. What's the median wage in Ghana? You're talking average labor sort of pricing, 700, 800 Ghana cities. You understand me? So if you're unwell in Savannah region, where a lot of people are farmers and other things, and you're earning even a thousand cities. Would you take a quarter of your wage just to do a, a, a coronavirus test just to check if you're infected? Probably not. So you're right in saying that. So when you're looking at this from a public health standpoint, you need to look at the um, demographic dynamics and um, affordability of the people to be able to make um, a judgment. And yes, if you do it that way, then you yeah. would realize that 
they wouldn't test enough in that region because they just can't afford to. Savannah is quite problematic because if you look at all the figures, it's Savannah that's showing about the lowest recovery and uh, discharge rate. And that's quite concerning. So Savannah 75.6. And then we're also looking at the Northeast region, 87.9, which is also, you know, quite, quite yeah. low compared with the national average. And then there's Bono East 2, which is 90.8. And then there's also Upper West, 90.6. So there are a number of regions that... that are uh, around the 90 mark, but you're right in saying that um, Savannah um, is much, much lower. And that's what I'm saying, that the people in these communities cannot be living in, quote-unquote, a fool's paradise to say a Yeska for area, because the risks are similar uh, everywhere you go. So for them to be not caring and assuming it's going to affect a number of people, and you also have to look at the dynamics. Even if you're a for your area, people are traveling. Currently, the president and his entourage are on tours in the Northeast and other things. If people are traveling from the citadel of the issue into the hinterland where they are not, there's a likelihood that they could be cross infections yes. and other things. When they get it, are they still going to say yes, Kafuayari? Because we, the country cannot be locked down. And this is the broader approach that I believe the citizen needs to look at the pandemic as it stands now. Because as it stands, they are just assuming that we've learned to live with the virus. Yeah. Truth of the matter is we have to learn to live with the virus. But to learn to live with the virus means to be compliant with the protocol. What's the compliance level? Extremely low. And that is where the concern comes. The next thing I want us to talk about is how vaccination plays into all of this. But before then, let's go back to the figures as we have it. This is a June 1. And look at the, and see if we can see a correlation uh, between the uh, recovery. Okay, so this is June 1, the figures for June 1. June 1. And we seem to have and that's what the point I was making. Do you see that this, um, how Savannah was high then? Yeah. Do you now realize the mortality trends I'm talking about? They were, recoveries were 95.9. Now they've dropped to 75. What does that tell you? And, and this is something that you don't stand in the middle. You either get it, you recover, you're an active case, or you pass away. And their recovery and discharge has dropped significantly over a nine week period from 95 to 75, that's a 20% drop. You see, and these, are, for someone like me who looks at the data, these are the trends that are concerning to me. And these are the points that I'm making, because if you look, there were three, only 3% 3 off the national average. But you can say that the national average of recoveries has dropped from 98 to 94 because of regions like Savannah, who are way off our average recovery rate. And these are the things that the citizenry critically should look at. Because at this point in time, much as people would say leadership, leadership, and I've been one who's advocated that leadership is the cause, everything is effect, we need to realize that with the level of spread we have, there should be localized leadership as well. And without people in these regions realizing the stakes, their recovery rates will continue dropping. And you can say the same for all the regions you identified, because you realize they were all 98 nights. Now, suddenly, they have dropped significantly. So let's go back to it. And so you can see the trend. There must be something happening in the Savannah region, which it would mean that would require the health officials to pay particular attention to. I don't think the health officials are not aware of this. I, I don't think, and like I've said, if I'm looking at this and I'm aware of this, I'm quite sure my brother is aware. I'm quite sure uh, Dr. Amadji is aware of it. But the truth of the matter is, at this point, having put out so much information, the citizenry also have a role to play in assimilating that information, diversifying it, and complying. That is not happening. And that is why I have always said that our risk communication has been an issue, because the citizenry are judging the level of risk they face poorly in those regions, even though their recovery rates are dropping. That clearly tells you, 
you are at higher risk, but you're behaving as though there's nothing at stake. Yeah. That should be worrying to anybody. And that's, those are the things that, for me, the citizenry in those areas should need to be located. I'll throw in something else, which I think is also impacting on the numbers and uh, playing a role, and that's vaccination. So if you take Greater Accra, where we've known Greater Accra to be the epicenter, we've had a lot more vaccines in the Greater Accra region, mm -hmm. in the Ashanti region, than the other regions. And these are the regions too that you're likely to encounter people who are saying that I don't want a vaccine, or we haven't paid attention to. Do you think we should be having another look at our approach? But first of all, the fact that our recovery numbers in Greater Accra region may have improved or may be looking this well. No, they have, they, they have a go back and you realize that 5th September, it's um, 98. So, but so it's, this Greater Accra region, yes. June 1. Yeah, across the country, that's another thing. And that's the, what I was saying, that mortalities have gone up. Recovery rates have dropped everywhere because more people, unfortunately, are passing away. And that is why you see 336 at 31st of August, 1084. More people are passing away with COVID now. All right. But we are not paying attention. And that's why, but some areas have dropped significantly. So 20% drop is off the normal. A 10% drop is off the normal. So those regions we are talking about. But to answer your question about vaccines. Vaccines. Vaccination is a huge strategy. And I can clearly understand why the concentration was on Greater Accra and Ashanti. Because in, in public health emergencies, there's something called ring vaccination. When you identify the problem, the seat of the problem, the quickest way to contain the problem is to vaccinate around it. That is how Ebola was managed. You vaccinate around it, and then you vaccinate in it so that the people cannot come out. It's, about, it's similar to forming an artificial barrier around the problem. And so that was what was done in, for health workers because they have to protect themselves in the hotspots of Greater Accra, the hotspots of Ashanti and other things. Brilliant. That seems to have slowed down the mortalities in those areas as well because you've protected the vulnerable people. Has the dynamics or is the dynamics changing in such a way that we have to look at the other regions? Probably yes at this point in time. But you cannot also neglect Greater Accra and Ashanti because they still are hotbeds of infection. Yeah. And if they cause superior infection with our travel routes and all that, they are going to spread into the hinterlands anyway. So you will need a bi what I call a bipolar approach in trying to still suppress the hotspots by identifying the hotspots in these regions where we are identifying recovery rate drops and also ring vaccinate around them. And that's the only way we can go. Okay, so I want you to advise, how would you approach this vaccination-wise and risk communication-wise? Well, vaccination-wise, it's about a number of things. Vaccine hesitancy, because someone who tells you that a Yeska area is more unlikely to take the vaccine. So those people have to be made to understand the need to take the vaccine. That's one thing, especially now that the vaccine supply chain is improving and it's improved significantly. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to ask yourself the moral question. And the moral question is something that the public health people have to do. Based on the data we have now, it is known that if you have one dose of a vaccine, the antibodies and the protection is detected for up to 45 weeks after the first dose. The data is now clear. It used to be ambiguous, and that is why I, for one, when the AstraZeneca doses were delaying, I'm quite sure I had a number of private yeah. conversations with you because I was looking at the data and said, I'm concerned about the delay, but I'll not split hairs about it because of the data I was seeing. Based on that data, and with the supply chain improving, what should be the approach of the Ghana Health Service? Should it be give two doses at an eight to 12 week interval, or try and cover as much people with one dose to optimize the protection, I would go for the one dose strategy, even though people would be edgy about it. But looking at the data, I would go for the one dose strategy, especially in those regions that we have um, identified, with the hope that the supply chain would continue to improve. But 
I see bumps in the supply chain moving forward, especially with what's going on in Israel, with the numbers going up and all other things, and then wanting to go for booster jabs. The UK has already made it known they will do that. They are vaccinating up to 12 years. So there might be kinks in the supply chain, but I don't see it now that India is out of the woods mm. and they being the largest producer, that being an issue. How about we, I mean, as part of the strategy that, you, that you're talking about, how about we give the single dose vaccines to those hard to reach populations or the people who are more likely to experience vaccine hesitancy, give it to them so that those in the urban areas who will be available for the second dose that is, is reserved for them. So we can reserve the double jabs for those in the urban areas and then give the single dose jabs to those in the rural areas. Yeah, I mean, whichever strategy you use, that would that'd be a good idea. See, the thing about vaccination is that there are two levels of protection. There's the community protection that you get because a large number of the people have been vaccinated. Yeah. And therefore, the ability of the virus to spread is constrained. And that's where all this herd immunity calculation comes from. So you don't have the number of people you've vaccinated. The less likely anyone is to get infected. The less likely someone is to get infected, the less likely they are going to fall sick, they're hospitalized, and they'll unfortunately go through that journey to a mortality. So the community infection is key. And then there's the personal inf um, protection, which is how likely it is that a vaccinated person would still get infected, get symptoms, get hospitalized, and go through that journey to mortality. The data is clear from all the vaccines um, even with this Delta variant that, based on the vaccines being used in Ghana, two doses, you are around 80% personal protection. Yeah, right. And you still have that 20% where you could get infected. And that's why you hear, oh, this person has gone infected and unfortunately has gone hospitalized and a few unfortunately have died. So that is why I'm looking at the one dose, two dose strategy and saying, are we enhancing our community protection? And that for me is key. Because the more enhanced our community protection, the more augmented your individual protection will be. It's like wearing a face mask. If you wear it, you protect me. If I wear it, I protect you. If both of us wear it, we protect each other. Yes. If you wear it and I don't wear it, you protect me, but I increase the probability if I have the infection of infecting you. That is the same strategy with vaccination. So it is the public health strategy, and that's why I'm saying, if I was making the decisions, I'll go for one dose, widespread rather than two days just to enhance the community. All right, and th there's one other thing that we'll, we'll have to talk about, vaccine hesitancy. They're, they're those who believe that, well, they don't want to take the vaccine for various reasons. And there are those two who are saying that they're not going to wear their mask because they don't believe. Indeed, there's uh, one uh, gentleman that we spoke with at the New Plan Station that was last week, and uh, he had something. He was, he was insistent, he was adamant that he wasn't going to wear the mask. I want us to bring back that, uh, that clip, and then I'll come back to Dr. Kamisa Punisiedu for rest to get to address some of these concerns. Because there are people who are there who are, they don't believe that there's anything like COVID. And because they say that they don't know anybody who has had COVID. We'll, let's hear from this, this gentleman and then we'll come back into the story. I face mask. It's a Ghana had there, you say and share mask. But I want to know why I won't share mask. I want to know why I won't share mask. Master, I'm fine, you know, I'm in Casa. He said he won't speak to us, but um, maybe whilst Emmanuel is, is taking the um, video around, let me speak to him about it. Pacha, where you, where you come on? All right, so you see a gentleman like this who says he's not going to wear a face mask. And there are many like him. What do you say to convince someone like this? Or how do we go about the campaign, public sensitization, to get people to wear masks? Interesting question. You see, I remember at the start of this pandemic, we had um, a number of conversations, both on this channel and on your own program, um, around risk communication. 
And there were two schools of thoughts. And I've always said that with science, if you present two people with the same data, it's not out of character that two scientists would come to different conclusions. So there was one school of thought, which was spread cow, not fear. Yeah. Which typically said, if you level up to the citizenry, you might get them in a state of panic. There was another school of thought by some like myself, which said, when communicating risk to a human, you have to realize that you are communicating not to the person, but to their hormones. And you have to trigger the right hormones to elicit the right response. So when you are communicating to a human being, the human being has four prime hormones that control it. Serotonin, that controls its mood. If you have low serotonin, you are depressed and all that. Oxytocin, that controls how it, the person cares and how the person laughs and other things. And there's adrenaline that controls flight, fear, and all that. If you are communicating, I've left out the thought for um, important reasons, and I'll come to it. If you are communicating, if you communicate to the hormone of love, the person is less precautionary. You communicate so to the hormone of mood. If you communicate to the hormone of fear, the person is always cautious. And that is why, even in the army, you realize that they get young people in states of war and they deprive them of congenial sex and other things to get them pent up so that in the theater of operation they can't be honest. It's, it's the research. But more importantly, the last hormone, which is dopamine, which is the hormone of reward. That always, com you communicate to it to let the person understand that if you do this, if you wear a face mask, you're going to protect yourself and you're going to protect me. If I wear it, I'm going to do the same. If we both wear it, it's double protection. And the reward is, if you do that, the likelihood of getting infected would go down and triggering adrenaline and fear that, hey, I could probably die, would be mitigated against. Spread calm, not fear, communicated to the first two hormones, serotonin and oxytocin. And I have always believed we are paying the price for that strategy with the level of compliance we are getting. And that is why I felt that you don't need to panic the population, but you also don't need to let them think but there's nothing at stake here. Yeah. And so I think we need to revisit this. And now, especially with stations like yourself and the radio programs, they need to go into the statistics and let people understand that our health managers need the level of support now to alter the communication for people to understand the level of risk. If we don't do that, then compliance is going to be low. And the only strategy out of this would be vaccination because the more, like I said, to enhance community protection. Yeah. Because we would have lost the public health community protection that comes from face masks and um, compliance with the protocol. Talking about the communication and communicating the fear to the fear in us, would you also suggest, because there have been, we've had a number of people who have had COVID, very prominent people, but we have been unable to suggest or indicate or point out that these people have elsewhere in the in the UK is a lot easier for people to get COVID to come out to say that I had COVID and when people die of COVID they say or their families will say that this person died of COVID. Yeah I mean there are even some who have been vaccine skeptics have gotten into ICU and have spoken out of ICU publicly that they were skeptics and you know a lot of them have been published and unfortunately have died. Yeah. Yes that is the risk communication I'm talking should about. Should we have or should we make it a point to put out some public figures who have died of COVID, to probably communicate to others that COVID is real. Well, yes, you can make that argument, but you have to also realize that in communications like that, if the person has passed away, there's a next of kin. The next of kin then makes the decisions moving forward about the estate of the person, including the circumstances under which they died. Unless the next of kin and the family are comfortable with this. You cannot go down that route. And you have to look at it from the point. Why is it that 
someone who's a vaccine skeptic, vaccine hesitant, would go into ICU in the UK and is prepared to be filmed and is prepared to speak out openly even though they know they are at the point of death. And why is it that in Ghana, families would be skeptical about their out information, information about that their, their loved one unfortunately passed? It's because of the stigmatization we've attached to COVID. And the stigmatization also comes from this communication strategy we took. Because we should have made people aware that it's not a stigma to die of COVID, but if, um, what you call risks are real for someone with X, Y, Z characteristics, school morbidities and all that, obesity, age and all that. Because we all know that for every six years, age, there's a doubling in the risk of death if you contract COVID. These are statistics that so, yes, that would be a good strategy if they want to communicate okay. that way. But the answer is, with our social architecture, would people want to go down that route? Because you have to bear in mind that some have even denied. On social media, we've seen it, that their loved ones died of COVID, even though they tested positive and health professionals knew. And even for some of them, we actually saw public health professionals involved in the interment of the body, but they still come out to deny that they didn't die of COVID. How do you expect such a person who has sworn to the point of death that the mortality was nothing to do with this pandemic to suddenly turn around and say, ah, <laughs> yes, they died of COVID. I know. And, and you see, these are the challenges that we don't hardball and level up to. And then we get foxed up in a situation like this where you want to alter the communication and communicate to the appropriate hormones but you are constrained because originally the people have go. gone in denial yeah. and to climb down on the original accession is yes, a lot, yeah. a lot difficult. of difficulty to themselves and might even eke out the pain of the bereavement, which now may be subsiding. So there's a lot out there that you have to look at. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, Dr. Kwame Safong Esiedu, who is... Uh, a pharmacist based with CDD Ghana as well. He's usually based in the UK, but today we have him here in the studio. We'll be coming back to summarize, to wrap up the conversation. But one of the things that stands out for me is the Savannah region and its, uh, its recovery cases, which suggest that uh, we should be careful or they have to pay particular attention to their, their cases. And uh, so that's... So if you want to do something, 37. Yes. Add it to um, what do the you The 155. Call it? Yes, 155. Which is the recovery which discharge. Which is the recovery. You subtract it from this and you get the amount. And that's why I didn't want to do some of these calculations because. Let, let's, 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 let's quickly <laughs> do that. So 47 yeah. plus uh, 1. No, so we're taking the 155 minus 47. All right, I lost that. 155 no, no. minus 47. Yeah, you, you, we can do it while on the break and put the, the, the data. But that's, that's how easy it is to look at some of these figures yeah. and come out with. So that's it. Okay, so 155 minus 47, we're having one... No, one. no, 155 is what has recovered. Okay, so... 47 is what's active. So okay. if you add the two together... Okay, so we're getting one, 202, I believe, yeah. So th that's, that's, how you, you, that's how you can do all these calculations. But then you realize that what's their active case count? About 50% of their caseload is active. Yeah. 47 over, over this. And that should tell you that they disproportionately have a higher risk. So you look at these numbers, and that is some of the numbers that normally I throw up in my head, and yeah. I'm like, these people need to realize that the communication is not about the Ghana Health Service any longer. It's about their level of localized risk, and they need to be aware of it. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kwame Sapunge Siedu, um, uh, and thank you for joining us in the studio. And I'm sure we're having a lot more conversations uh, after this, uh, this, the, the AM show.